Okay, uh, this is uh, we're this is the class for April sixth, maybe even a April eighth. We'll see how how long we can get through it. Come on, you can pick this thing up. There we go. There we go. Okay, uh, this is chapter eight. Uh, we're going to get through about a hundred slides uh, this week. Uh, so I need to get through a hundred slides this week so that we can get through all the uh, all the material. Uh, so we'll see how far we get. Uh, psychoactive drug. This is about um, drug use and prevention uh, from cradle to grave. So here we go. Uh, fetus is ex exposed to heroin through the umbilical cord after an addicted mother shoots up. Oh golly, what do we do about that? Uh, a 14 year old is offered MDMA at a party to get rolling. What do we do about that? College student troubled by bulimia makes herself throw up five times a week. What do we do about that? Here's a looker for you. A young mother with three children hides in her room to cr smoke crack and obviously doesn't take care of the, the children. 28-year-old uh, uh, IV uh, methamphetamine user infects his girlfriend with HIV from having sex after using a contaminated needle. One office, uh, one worker is taking clonopin to deal with anxiety, while another takes Prozac to combat depression. Uh, mother with grown children uh, battles boredom and the empty nest syndrome by compulsively playing poker machines. That sounds like fun. 50-year-old salesman on the road smokes and drinks to cope with his loneliness. 74-year-old with arthritis borrows hydrocodone from a neighbor to relieve the pain. He has run out. So what do we do? How do we prevent and treat uh, these problems? Uh, encourage pregnant mothers to attend prenatal care programs to teach them how drugs affect fetuses. I've already told you I have a great niece who gave birth to a heroin addicted baby because she couldn't stop or she wouldn't stop, or something. Greater public scrutiny of parties limiting the use of club drugs. One way to do it. Offering counseling on eating disorders in high schools and colleges. Using outreach workers to encourage drug users to practice safe sex and use clean needles to prevent the transmission of HIV and hepatitis C uh, while att attempting to bring them into treatment. Doing an intervention to get a heavy drinking sales representative into an employee assistance program. Holding seminars to enlighten senior citizens about drug cross reactions. Each society has to decide how they want to attempt to prevent self-destructive drug use. Are they trying to prevent any use of psychoactive substances? Are they trying to ban just illicit drug use? Are they trying to limit the damage caused by use? Uh, abuse and addiction. These are all things that you need to decide. And of course, uh, when we're talking about opiate and opioid addictions, uh, the society needs to decide what they want to do about it. Uh, they need to decide whether they just want to, to reduce the number of, of addicts on the street, or do they want to stop all psychoactive substances completely? Uh, this has been a question that we've been asking for an extended length of time. Uh, what are we what are we doing about marijuana? It's being legalized around the United States uh, So what what is it that we want to do in other states? It's illegal uh, a good example is uh, New Mexico uh, New Mexico stops uh, semi trucks um, on, on uh, 80 or 40 you guys it's 40 down south uh, on 40 <laughs> Uh, they, they stop semis to check to make sure that they're not hauling marijuana. Uh, if they, are, they can haul marijuana legally uh, as long as it is hemp and not, uh, and not uh, marijuana with uh, excessive amounts of THC in them. The, U the United States and most other countries use a three-tier approach to fight destructive effects of psychoactive substances. A primary prevention is a program to teach the skills to help the individual resist drug use. Secondary prevention, stopping the behavior wherever and whenever it starts. And tertiary prevention is putting people through treatment and restoring them to, to health. In other words, we're trying to keep them from starting, we're trying to stop them when they do start, and we're trying to 
to fix them if they are if they are drug addicts. So those are the three uh, prevention programs: uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Governments work on prevention by reducing the supply of drugs through interdiction of drug supply, legislating against its use, uh, legal pen penalties for possession, use, and distribution. Uh, how do we reduce the demand? We treat uh, treatment of drug dependency and prevention through education, emotional development, moral growth, and individual and community activities. How do we reduce the, reduce the harm that can be done to the community? We promote temperance. We institute needle exchange programs. We support uh, drug substitution programs. We loosen the effects of alcohol. Oh, I'm sorry. We lessen the effects of alcohol. Uh, by promoting designated driver programs, and we de decriminalize uh, drug use to reduce the number of people in our prisons. Worldwide, the most widely used and successful programs have been supply reduction and temperance uh, methods. Historically, in the United States, drinking and smuggling of spirits became part of the American fabric before the Revolutionary War. This was one of the huge complaints that people uh, that uh, the English had uh, was the fact that a lot of people in the United States were smuggling alcohol. The alcohol they were smuggling was corn liquor. And the reason they were smuggling it is because it was illegal to transport it. They had to pay a tax on it. Uh, the English had a, had a tax on, on any liquor. And of course, they were trying to smuggle it out of the country and sell it at a, at a high profit rather than having to pay taxes on it. Um, one of the reasons why they, they uh, produce so much corn liquor is because it's easier for farmers to ship a gallon of, of, uh, of uh, corn liquor than it is for them to, to, to uh, uh, ship uh, you know, 15 bushels of corn. 15 bushels of corn takes up a lot of room. One gallon of, of uh, corn whiskey doesn't take up very much room at all. However, with the influx of evangelical influences, there was a movement in the United States in the 18th century. There was a, a Baptist revival movement in the United States, and there was a Methodist revival uh, in the United States. Uh, the temperance became more acceptable as, uh, as an alternative to heavy drinking and drunkenness. And sometimes you can watch movies and you can see this uh, on uh, movies that uh, are dealing with uh, the the uh, early uh, 20th or 19th century. Uh, you can see the, uh, the uh, effects of these ministers wandering around and talking to people and trying to talk them out of drinking so much. Even to this day, uh, Methodists and Baptists, if you've ever been around them, uh, they don't drink very much or they don't drink, they're not supposed to drink at all, which means that some people are sneaking around. <laughs> I grew up in a Methodist community and I grew up in a our county was it was primarily Methodist, and it was a dry county. It was against the law to drink alcohol any place except in your home. Uh, they s only sold it at uh, liquor stores. Uh, you couldn't buy. It was illegal for a child to go into a bar. Uh, it was illegal for them to sell alcohol any place where there were minors. Uh, so what happened was that uh, they didn't have any alcohol in the stores uh, like Walmart has down in Gallup. Uh, they didn't have any alcohol in uh, the, uh, the small stores, the corners, corner grocery stores. Uh, that was illegal as well because children went in there. Any place there was a child, you couldn't sell liquor. Such behaviors came to be seen as destructive, sinful, and immoral because of the religious aspect of it. An effort uh, was made to get drinkers to switch from hard spirits to weaker beer, wine, and hard cider, uh, as interesting as that is. So they were actually not telling people they couldn't drink. What they were telling people was, uh, well, don't drink whiskey, uh, don't drink gin, you need to drink uh, softer, softer uh, alcohol like beer and wine and hard cider because it doesn't have as much alcohol in it, and you need to drink a lot more of it before you're going to get, actually get drunk. Dealing with the problem of alcohol consumption has been a continuing problem in the United States, fluctuating between moderation and forced abstinence. Abstinence, and of course, forced abstinence was prohibition between 1919 and 19, 
32, I think, 32 or 33. As a country, use and the responsive movements have waxed and waned in 70-year cycles since the beginning of our history. Uh, 1780, Dr. Benjamin Rush tried to legislate control over distilled spirits. He was unsuccessful. And the reason he was unsuccessful is because they needed the tax revenue uh, to pay for the Revolutionary War. 1850, temperance movement supported replacing uh, distilled spirits with more benign drinks such as hard cider, beer, and wine uh, because they, they assumed uh, that if they were drinking s softer uh, liquors, uh, then uh, of course they wouldn't get drunk as readily. And of course there would be less domestic violence, there would be less uh, uh, violence on the streets. 1920, the prohibition of alcohol occurred, of course, and that, that uh, continued until 1932. Uh, 1990, legal drinking age was uh, raised to uh, 21 nationwide. Uh, the only state that was a holdout was uh, Louisiana because of Mardi Gras, as weird as that sounds. Uh, but what they did, uh, this, was, this was right after 1990. Uh, actually, it was more like 1980. Anyway, they uh, um, refused to give them any uh, federal uh, uh, road uh, funds, any highway funds. And uh, eventually, of course, they came around. If, when I was, uh, where was I stationed? We were in Mississippi and we, would, we, drove, we drove across Louisiana. Why did we go to Louis? Oh, we were in Texas, and we drove across Louisiana. Uh, we were stationed at uh, Shepherd Air Force Base. Uh, anyway, the the roads in Louisiana. You knew when you were entering Louisiana because the roads were just the the interstates were just horrible, and of course that was because they didn't have any money for for the for their roads. Did the Eighteenth Amendment work? You know, this is a question that people ask. People that uh, are in favor of legalizing marijuana, they say, "Well, look, prohibition didn't work." Well, the reality is, prohibition did work, and uh, and here's the here's here are the statistics on it. Of course, the 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 uh, uh, question is, how are you going to look at this? Are you going to are you going to look at this from a medical point of view, or are you going to look at it from a legal point of view? Uh, I, I've had this argument with lawyers, and lawyers say, well, it didn't work because of all the organized crime. And the reality is, yes, there was more organized crime, uh, bootlegging uh, liquor, uh, but it still uh, reduced the amount of alcohol being uh, uh, consumed in the United States. Alcoholic psychosis admissions to state hospitals in New York and Massachusetts was cut nearly in half. Uh, deaths due to cirrhosis of the liver were cut half uh, in half during Prohibition as well. Uh, general crime was reduced by one-third. Uh, there was less domestic violence in the United States. Even after Prohibition stopped, drinking levels remained low and didn't return to pre-Prohibition levels until the 1950s. This, is, uh, this takes in the 1930s, 1940s, and 1950s. It didn't uh, the drinking level didn't return to, to normal until the 1950s, or not normal, uh, to the, the pre-prohibition levels. Medical problems increased from unregulated manufacturing al of alcohol, but the level never approached the medical problems that, that the nation experienced from alcohol. In other words, the cirrhosis of the liver and the, the alcoholic psychosis. Some argue that prohibition brought organized crime to the, United, to the United States, but in reality, organized crime has been part of the American underworld fabric since long before the 1920s. And if you don't believe it, uh, then you can watch uh, Gangs of New York. Uh, that, that is just a reality. That has been a reality in the United States for an extended length of time. Unfortunately, one problem from prohibition uh, was that because banning alcohol was touted as a cure for all of society's ills. Treatment for alcohol addiction was cut. Uh, it did not did not cure all of, of society's ills. Uh, people could point at organized crime increasing. Uh, and that's true, it did, it, it did increase. But that's just one aspect of uh, what prohibition was supposed to do. 
Some people claim that prohibition was repealed because of the universal condemnation of the ban. This isn't true at all. Uh, before prohibition uh, was passed in 1919, uh, most of the states already prohibited the uh, sale and the manufacture of, manufacture of alcohol. There were only select states that didn't. Uh, two-thirds of the, the United States push you in order for an amendment to pass. Two-thirds of the states have to ratify the amendment. And uh, they had already, they already had 60% of the states uh, that had banned uh, alcohol uh, production and sale. M Maine um, prohibited uh, alcohol sale and, and uh, manufacture in 1851. I mean, it, this, is, this was a, a movement that was going on all over the United States. But the real reason for its repeal was due to the need for tax revenues from its manufacture and use during the Great Depression. Pressure from wets and fatigue dealing with the con continued argument did not hurt either. So it, it was, it's just like if you go on these marijuana websites, these pro-marijuana uh, legalized marijuana websites, they, they use really uh, bad science uh, to, to prove their point. Uh, or, and they say that everybody wants to, 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 that it, to make it legal, and that's just not true. In 1962, before the Civil Rights Movement uh, hit its stride and before the Vietnam War, only about 2% of the American public used illicit drugs. I know this is true because I was around in 1962. First, I grew up in a dry county, uh, but the reality was that there were lots of dry counties in the United States. There were lots of places where you couldn't, uh, where you couldn't uh, sell alcohol. However, with the aforementioned social movements and an air of civil disobedience streaking through the youth of the 60s and 70s, 31% of the population was using illicit drugs in the 60s and 70s. Afterwards, 2% of the American public had used illicit drugs before Vietnam and the civil rights movement. Afterwards, it was a third of the population. During this time, knowledge-based programs were started to teach about pharmacological effects, causes of addiction, health effects of drug use, and legal penalties. There is no evidence that information alone causes changes in behavior. And unfortunately, of course, we can't tell people, look stupid, uh, if you drink alcohol and you drive, then you're going to be impaired and you're more likely to hurt, hurt yourself or somebody else. It, it just doesn't work that way, just because you can tell somebody that. And, of course, this is what's happening with the, the, uh, the attempt to legalize marijuana. Uh, there's a lot of negative things about marijuana, and we may be destroying our future by uh, legalizing marijuana. But, of course, people don't listen. People only hear what they want to hear. Skill building and resiliency programs. As more research is being done, it was discovered that there were obvious psychological and developmental factors that predisposed select individuals to drug use. Programs aimed at these individuals targeted social skills that might protect the individual from experimentation. Skills that addressed risk factors that might lead to drug abuse included general competency, competency building, competency building training and self-esteem, uh, socially acceptable behavior, decision making, self-assertion, problem solving, and vocational skills. If we can give people something to do, they're less likely to, to waste, wa waste away their, their hours, their days, uh, by just sitting around and smoking dope or drinking alcohol or whatever. Uh, some of these individuals uh, suffered uh, during their high school years. You know, so what do we do? We raise their self-esteem. We, uh, we make uh, uh, good behavior, socially acceptable behavior. We, we give them the ability to, to make their own decisions, to be more self-assertive, to solve their own problems, and we give them a damn job. Coping, uh, resistance skills, uh, developing self-reliance, confidence, and inner resources. A lot of people, this is one of the things that we're talking about now that we're in lockdown for the coronavirus, is the fact that uh, people need each other. And sometimes peer pressure is, this, is, is so devastating that people just cannot uh, resist it. 
reinforcing protective factors in resiliency, uh, build uh, on uh, natural strengths that people already ha uh, have available. Um, for, uh, hopefully they're optimistic, uh, they're empathic, uh, they're insightful, uh, they have intellectual competence, so they understand what you're talking about. Uh, they have self-esteem, so they don't need people to uh, accept them uh, by, uh, by doing drugs. They're giving them a direction or a purpose in life. A lot of uh, stoners coming out of high school just don't seem to have a direction. And so one of the things we need to do is give them a direction or purpose in life. Uh, determination, supportive friends and family, opportunities to belong to meaningful groups. And of course, these are positive groups, not uh, the uh, local drunks down that, that sit on the corner or that group that uh, keeps panhandling, uh, wandering around boshes, I'm sorry, bashes uh, in Chin Li. Skill building and resiliency programs address and, and reverse risk factors. R risk factors associated with future substance use disorders should be examined with the focus being to seek strategies to minimize their development. Early aggressive oppositional disorder, uh, poverty, lack of parental supervision, dysfunctional drug abusing, uh, peers and of course these are all problems uh, that we see and this is one of the reasons why people turn to drugs uh, they're poor uh, their parents didn't care um, their peers are dysfunctional and they abuse drugs uh, they have prob they have pr had problems when they first started in school why did they have problems when they first started in school because they lack parental supervision their parents didn't care Support system development, endeavoring to reduce uh, stress for students, which should decrease the need for drug and alcohol abuse. Of course, here we are in lockdown uh, for the coronavirus. There's a curfew on the reservation. Uh, so that's in increasing the stress for everybody, not just for, for the students. Does that mean that drug and alcohol abuse is, are going to become uh, more prevalent uh, during this, this lockdown until the end of the month? And the answer is, we don't know yet. Uh, we're not even thinking about that. All we're trying to do is stop the number of deaths. The medical community, all, the, all they can care about is stopping the number of deaths, reducing the number of deaths uh, caused by the coronavirus. And the, eventually, we're, all of this is going to come out. How, much, how many suicides did we have? How many murders did we have? Uh, there was a case uh, in New York City uh, where this, this individual's neighbors were making too much noise. He went over and he shot five people. I think he killed them all, too. Changing the environment. Uh, one early target for concentration is the social and environmental influences that lead to drug use. Um, what family values do you have? What peer group are you, mess are you uh, involved with? Uh, what are their values? And uh, how does your... Uh, what are the practices in your school? This is an attempt to get the entire neighborhood to take responsibility for, for preventing substance abuse by assessing the needs of the community, by coordinating existing services, by changing laws and public policy to reduce availability, by increasing funding for family, school, and community prevention, and community-wide training and planning. All of this takes somebody to lead, and the problem is a lot of problems in communities is there is no follow-through. There's nobody who leads and then follows through with their programs. The pub public health model for prevention sees addiction as a disease. This uh, is uh, like alcohol, all Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous assumes that addiction, in this case alcohol, is a disease and therefore it should be treated as a disease. The user is a genetically predisposed host. Um, that's one of the ideas. The environment contributes to the problem. Uh, so you're living in the wrong environment. You're genetically, your, your family were drunk, so you're a drunk. Uh, and it is a disease that you can't get over. The drug is introduced, causing the disease, of course. Prevention involves disrupting the relationship between one or more of these factors. Uh, the family approach, this approach sees addiction stemming from family dynamics. Uh, mom was a drunk, dad was a drunk. Uh, so, uh, so Sally and, and Susie and, and Johnny and Billy are all drunks, even though Eric is, isn't one. Uh, 
Families are bolstered through family support, skills training, therapy if they need it, and parenting programs to teach them how to be good parents. One of the biggest problems uh, that we have with crystal meth is that uh, when uh, somebody is smoking crystal meth, uh, a lot of times they don't care about their kids, and the last thing that is on their mind is taking care of their children. Uh, we had a case like that uh, on the Fort Belknap Reservation. Uh, the mother uh, wanted her babies so badly, uh, and, and she had two of them, uh, but when she was smoking dope, she, had, she didn't care. She didn't care what was going on with them. And both of the children were raped uh, during a or molested during a uh, a house party that she was that she was having. Uh, she called it a uh, what did she call it? She was trying to make her rent, so she was she had a big stash of uh, crystal meth, and she brought in people, and they you know they paid to get in, and they paid for the for the uh, crystal meth, and during the night while she was off having sex with somebody or. Everybody, I don't know. Uh, somebody went into the children's bedroom and they molested the children. Uh, two days later, uh, the grandparents went over and uh, uh, there were the children. They were they hadn't been fed in a couple days because mom was was uh, sacked out uh, after smoking all that dope. She hadn't been awake for twelve or fourteen hours, and here the kids hadn't been fed. Their diapers hadn't been changed, and uh, there was there was uh, evidence that uh, the children had been messed with. This approach focuses on the family rather than the environment. Of course, uh, that was an ugly environment. That wasn't on the Fort Belknap Reservation. That was on the uh, Rocky Boy Reservation, up uh, east of, or west of Haver. Uh, Fort Belknap is east of Haver. Supply reduction seeks to decrease uh, drug abuse by reducing the availability of drugs and is uh, the responsibility of state and local police departments, uh, the justice of the, uh, so that's your, your uh, state troopers and your local police, uh, your Department of Justice, uh, the FBI is part of the Debar Department of Justice, uh, Bureau of Prisons, uh, Immigration Naturalization Service, uh, and the Drug Enforcement Agency, uh, Treasury Department, the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Department, the Internal Revenue Service, and the Customs Service. Department of Transportation, I already told you about uh, the, uh, uh, the highway patrol that uh, stops uh, semis. And you see them stopped on 40 all the time. Uh, they're stopping them to make sure that they are in compliance, that they've been sleeping uh, when they're supposed to. They're, not, they're only supposed to drive eight hours, and then they have to stop for four then they can drive another eight, and then they can stop for four more. Or they, then they have to stop for the night, I think. But they can only uh, drive for uh, 16 hours, but they have to stop. Uh, at, uh, it, and I may be, have these numbers off, but that's what the Department of Transportation does. They also ask for their inventory, uh, and they look in the back to make sure the inventory is what they say it is. Uh, of course, the Department of Defense uh, does interdiction as well. Uh, a lot of their interdiction has to do with stopping the drugs uh, coming into the country, and they stop it on the other side of the border. Uh, when I was uh, teaching at uh, uh, Tinker Air Force Base, they were uh, recruiting individuals who could speak Spanish so that they could go down and, uh, and work with the drug in interdiction uh, force uh, for the Air Force. Navy has a group as well. I don't think the Army is really that involved in it. Uh, Coast Guard, is hu it's huge as far as the Co Coast Guard is concerned. The responsible agencies reduce uh, drug supplies by interdicting uh, drug smugglers, and of course that's what the Air Force, the Navy, and the uh, uh, Coast Guard were doing uh, down uh, in South America and, and uh, Central America. Uh, manning law enforcement activities at border crossings, uh, limiting the supply of precursor chemicals such as pseudoephedrine. Uh, you use pseudoephedrine to make uh, crystal meth. Uh, disrupting criminal gangs and organized crime. Uh, passing more severe laws. Increasing community police officers. Uh, this is one of the things that George W. Bush did. He decided that we had too serious a drug problem on many of the reservations, so he increased the number of police officers on the reservation. 
The problem is a lot of police officers on the reservation are local and uh, they uh, can be corrupt. And uh, in that case, uh, usually the uh, Bureau of Indian, if Indian Affairs comes in and they will remove the police department for that reservation and they will replace them with BIA uh, police officers. Uh, that means that you had a really serious problem with crime in your area and the police have become part of that, uh, that problem. And so they replace them with the BIA police officers. Uh, disrupting money laundering and seizing assets. Of course, this is uh, done by banks and uh, by the FBI. Supporting local and state police in high volume drug areas. Supporting the anti-drug efforts of foreign countries. That's something that we have stopped doing under this administration. Uh, don't ask me what the hell's going on. Uh, I can never. I can't answer for our president. <laughs> Enacting treaties to work uh, towards supply uh, reduction. Drug laws in the United States have evolved to cur curtail the supply and use of illicit drugs. Long prison terms and forfeiture of assets have been used to discourage suppliers and manufacturers of drugs. Users are discouraged by facing stiffer and increased jail time. Possession of paraphernalia adds to the length of uh, time spent in jail. Uh, and of course, these are all things that we have done in the past. Many states, including California, enacted three strike laws in the 1980s, which mandated life imprisonment if an individual committed three felonies in their lifetime. Since 1980, prison populations have tripled because of this. 55% of inmates in federal prisons were convicted of drug offenses. If you count felonies committed to support drug habits and, and per, uh, percentage, in, the percentage increases to 60 to 80 percent. Over half the inmates incarcerated admit to using drugs while they committed their offense. Uh, the percentage of teenagers is even higher. A great deal of money has been spent on supply reduction. Uh, advocates uh, estimate that it, was, it has resulted in a 10 to 15 percent supply reduction. The severe penalties have resulted in a delayed impulse to use. It has opened up treatment. It has kept people in treatment. Detractors of the policy complain that of uh, complain of the minor impact on supply. It's only reducing it 10 to 15 percent. Uh, there was we busted the uh, I can't remember what his name was El Chapo. We uh, is that his name? Wait a minute. Anyway, it was the kingpin of one of the cartels that, were, that was smuggling drugs not only into the United States, but all the way up to Chicago. They had a transportation network working in Chicago. And, of course, they, they busted the guy. Uh, unfortunately, that network has, has, has only reduced their traffic by about uh, 20%. Uh, just because you, you, take, you cut the head off the snake doesn't mean the snake is going to die. In this case, it grew another head. Detractors of the policy, oh, okay, we already talked about that. Demand reduction involves the three tiers of prevention, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Uh, primary uh, 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 prevention is promoting abstinence. If they never start, then you don't have to worry about them being, being an addict. Uh, help young people refuse drugs. It's not easy because of peer pressure. Uh, delay the age of first use. If you can delay the age of first use to 21, then the probability of them becoming an addict is very, very remote. Encourage healthy non-drug alternatives. Uh, the age of, the of first use is the strongest predictor of drug or alcohol use, as I said before. Individuals who experiment before age 12 have a four to five times likelihood of further drug use. Uh, something that we have learned from studies in New Zealand, Australia, and Canada, where they have, have had legalized marijuana for about 30 years. Uh, if you use marijuana before the age of 12, then your IQ can be reduced as many as 20 points. And uh, I don't know how many IQ points you have, but I couldn't stand to lose 20 points of my intelligence. Secondary prevention seeks to halt drug use once it has begun. Uh, this tier of prevention adds intervention to the primary strategies of education and skill building. The biggest problem with this program is denial by the user and their concealment of use, making them difficult to identify. Another problem with this tier of prevention is that there is a lag phase between first drug use and physical and emotional problems. 
the user feels that the educational programs are overstated. And that's what's happening with marijuana right now. People that want to legalize marijuana say that all of these statistics that people give us are skewed, that they're just trying to stop people from using marijuana. Marijuana is, is an herb. It's natural. It's, it's something that uh, doesn't hurt anybody. And the reality, of course, is that uh, the statistics and the research that they've done shows that there's um, that's not really true. Tertiary prevention uh, se seeks to provide treatment for the user to restore them to health. Uh, compulsive drug use is addressed through group intervention focusing on detoxification, abstinence, and recovery. Q extension, uh, ex extinction uh, therapy that desensitizes the user to people, places, and things that triggers their use. So if you were an individual that every time you came home, uh, you got around your buds and your buds said, come on, dude, let's go smoke some dope. If that was a trigger, then how would we extinguish uh, uh, that? Uh, uh, we would need to desensitize you to being around those individuals. I had a uh, student one time who every time she, she was on Fort Belknap, and every time she went to Great Falls, she felt like she needed to use crystal meth. So her her way of staying away from crystal meth was to stay out of, of, of Great Falls. As long as she was on Fort Belknap, she was fine. Uh, even though there was crystal meth on, on Fort Belknap, it, it wasn't one of her triggers. It, it wasn't one of her cues. Unfortunately, her father was in an accident. Uh, he was in a, uh, a farming accident, and this thing fell down on him, and it, it went all the way through his body. Uh, punch, punctured about like six different, him in six different places. And so he was in intensive care in, in Great Falls, of course. He, they took him to Great Falls. And as soon as she got into town, she never made it to her, her, her father's uh, hospital bed. Uh, she started using, and she had a psychotic episode. She thought she was somebody else. Uh, and, or I've told you the story uh, where she, she thought she was a Hispanic uh, lady and her Father had murdered her mother, uh, but her father died, of course, in, in this accident. Her mother was still alive, uh, so she, she told the police, and they went and they dug up the wrong, the wrong backyard. Well, there was no right backyard. She was having a psychotic episode. Anyway, so every time she went to Great Falls, so she had to stay out of Great Falls, or she used family therapy, group uh, psychotherapy, or residential treatment. Instruction in relapse prevention and life management skills, psychopharmacological strategies, promotion of healthy lifestyles, development of support and aftercare systems, and this, of course, is the 12-step program. Uh, step five, if I'm not mistaken, step five is to apologize to all the people you've hurt. Uh, my second wife, uh, once upon a time, communicated with me. This is after I was married the third time. But she called to apologize that she messed up my life and that she uh, hurt the kids and all the other stuff. The kids are fine. Don't worry. It's not nothing to worry about. Uh, I, she broke my heart, but, uh, you know, hearts are mendable. You can stick them back together. You can glue them back together. And I married a wonderful woman uh, for number three. Uh, so I'm, everything's okay. Everything's fine. So 12-step program. Tertiary programs result in decreased drug use or abstinence in 40 to 50 percent of the cases, 74 percent reduction in crime, uh, 2, 2,500,000 people received treatment nationwide last year. I looked this up just before this lecture. Unfortunately, 21,700,000 people are estimated to need treatment nationwide. So as you can see, we, we have actually doubled it in the last 10 years. Uh, the, the number of, of treatment facilities, uh, but uh, the number of people that uh, need treatment has increased by tenfold. Not all programs seek abstinence. Uh, harm reduction programs recognize that recovery is difficult and many will relapse before they are able to live their lives drug-free. This technique focuses on minimizing the personal and social problems caused by uh, drugs. Three harm reduction programs uh, one of them is a needle exchange program to reduce the spread of HIV and hepatitis C. 
uh, bleach distribution programs to reduce the spread of HIV and hepatitis. And the reason you're giving the bleach is so they can clean out their, their old needles or the needles that they have. Uh, a lot of times they don't have access to new needles. So you, they, need to ble they need to run bleach through their needle to clean them out. Legal dr Actually, if you don't run uh, uh, bleach through, if you don't clean out your needle, then it will clot up and you won't be able to suck anything up through the needle. Legal drug substitution for illegal drugs. This is the replacement of heroin with methadone is a good example of a drug exchange program. Harm reduction programs have also proposed some controversial ideas. Uh, they accept the fact that people will experiment with drugs and they want to educate them to use drugs responsibly. Decriminalizing or even legalizing illegal drugs uh, treat addicts by reducing their usage to the manageable level rather, rather than seek abstinence allow addicts to design their own intervention and treatment programs. Uh, the decriminalizing and even legalizing illegal drugs, uh, there have been people that, that want to legalize all drugs. They want to legalize heroin. They want to legalize crystal meth. Um, and they especially want to decriminalize it for people who are just users. Uh, we, can, uh, we can arrest uh, uh, suppliers, uh, but uh, they, they, they're trying to to get us to decriminalize uh, drugs. <clears throat> I personally don't think it's a very good idea. I don't like to think of my grandson. Uh, he's only seven years old. When he's uh, 12 or 13 years old, somebody asking him if he wants to uh, get high, you know, uh, which is probably going to happen anyway. But as long as it's illegal, he can say, no, this is illegal. I don't want to do this. Uh, if, it's, if it's legal, what's going to stop it? Some of the most lucrative advertising on television is advertising for alcoholic beverages. Before 1996, hard liquor was not advertised on television, only beer. The idea from temperance argument, from the temperance argument of the 19th century was that by replacing hard liquor with beer would reduce drunkenness and the destruction of alcohol. These ideas are still circulating out there, and it's one of the reasons why we started having, putting beer commercials on television. However, more people die from cirrhosis of the liver caused by beer than cirrhosis caused by hard liquor. A lot of people drinking a lot of beer. Uh, when I was in the service, I can remember the first time we ever had to, uh, uh, to uh, deal with an, an individual that was an alcoholic. Uh, the kid was, he was 21 and his girlfriend was 19. And they were drinking a case of beer a night. Uh, and uh, boy, I'll tell you what, they were a mess. Uh, sometimes they couldn't go, go to work the next morning. Uh, and of course, this isn't something you can do when you're in the military. You've got to go to work. You're, you're on duty 24-7, uh, theoretically. <clears throat> so uh, we, had to, we had to dry them out. Um, it was really kind of interesting. He drank, they drank different kinds of beer, which is a little weird to me. Uh, but she drank, um, what did she drink? He drank Budweiser. And she drank, um, it wasn't Corona, it was Heineken. She drank Heineken, which is a lot more expensive. Anyway, it was easier getting her to, uh, to dry her out than it was to dry him out. And, of course, it never did work. Um, he was only 21 years old, and we already saw liver damage as far as he was concerned. She, had, she was only 19, and she hadn't been drinking nearly as long as he had. He had been drinking uh, since he was in high school. And, of course, he'd been drinking... He, he had built up his tolerance uh, to alcohol, and here he was. He's 21 years old with liver damage of one kind or another. He didn't have cirrhosis, but he was, we needed to clean him up. It didn't work with him, but, uh, and they broke up after that because uh, that was part of their relationship, was the fact that they drank together. And they got drunk every night. I mean, it, was, it was just a really odd situation. Damage done by, of course, this was in the military. This was back in the 70s. Uh, class 6 stores. Uh, military has class 6 stores. Uh, so you could, you could buy really cheap uh, alcohol. And uh, unfortunately, uh, they, they, they bought Heineken and, uh, and Budweiser. Uh, damage done by legal drugs caused more damage to society than illegal drugs. Alcohol, tobacco, and prescription drugs do more damage than heroin or crystal meth. 
advertising for these drugs brings new users into the fold every year and we see these advertisements on television we're not seeing seeing nearly as many beer advertisements as we did before uh, if we see uh, you know captain morgan or we see uh some whiskey uh, uh, crown royal uh, or canadian well yes we don't see canadian club but if we see them on television of course they're always saying uh please drink responsibly that's going to that's going to make me drink responsibly if I'm a drunk uh, is uh, is by them telling me to do it facts to remember about prevention uh, there are no quick fixes uh, prevention will uh, never be complete because there will always be uh, new potential users to convince uh, prevention campaigns become progressively more difficult in time because they have already reached the easy cells uh, no single approach has been shown to work consistently Legalization of marijuana and the medical form of marijuana will make it more and more difficult to control all, all drugs. And I can promise you that's what's happening in Colorado, Massachusetts, uh, Washington State, uh, California, uh, where else? Alaska, uh, District of Columbia, Illinois has now legalized marijuana. So I can promise you that that's exactly what's going to happen. It's going to make uh, other uh, controlling of all other drugs more difficult. When we see depictions of drug addicts, addicts in the media, they are often portrayed as weak, bad, stupid, crazy, immoral, poor, and disenfranchised. One third of, of the homeless have a drug or alcohol problem, and that's why they are homeless. This only represents about 5% of the addicts in the United States. The truth is that whites are the most likely to have either a drug or alcohol problem. African Americans are most likely, uh, just as likely as whites to have a drug problem, but the least likely to have an alcohol problem. Hispanics are the least likely to have a drug problem. People in low income areas are less likely to receive treatment and more likely to be incarcerated for their drug use. More affluent people are more likely to receive treatment and probation. 53% of the individuals in prison for drug crimes are African American. 26% of those in prison for drug crimes are white. Among the highest paid occupation in the United States, physicians, they are as likely to be addicted as the general population, though they are more likely to be addicted to prescription drugs. Mem members of Mensa and the gifted high school students have high rates of addiction. Members of the clergy have high rates of alcoholism. While addiction rates fluctuate with uh, attempts to curtail use, over the last 40 years, the age of addicts has declined with the age of first use. Between 1991 and 2005, the number of 8th through 10th graders who used marijuana increased 60%. Uh, and now we're going to legalize it. So, geez, I wonder if it'll go up. Juvenile arrestees uh, testing positive for drugs uh, other than alcohol ranged from 48 to 65% in 2005. It is estimated that 18.6% of infants are exposed to alcohol in the womb. 4.5% of fetuses are exposed to cocaine. 17.4% of fetuses are exposed to tobacco. Fetal alcohol syndrome is the third most common birth defect and the leading cause of intellectual disability in the United States. Drug use during pregnancy can create nutritional and obstetrical complications, can cause anemia for the, uh, the mother, uh, sexually transmitted diseases because they don't know who they're having sex with, uh, diabetes uh, because alcohol turns into, uh, alcohol turns into uh, uh, sugar in your stomach. Everything turns into sugar in your stomach. Uh, high blood pressure, otherwise it's not food. That's, your cells can only utilize sugar or glucose. Uh, high blood pressure, neurological damage, weakened immune system, poor nutrition, hepatitis C exposure, uh, endocarditis. Uh, of course, if you're shooting up with, uh, uh, with a needle, then uh, the probability of hepatitis C exposure is there. Endocarditis, uh, which is uh, the inflammation of, of your heart. HIV and AIDS exposure. 80% of infants born with HIV in the United States were born to mothers who were IV drug users or the partners of men who were IV drug users. Thanks, Mom. Thanks, Dad. 
Worldwide, the figure is 90%. Unfortunately, the life expectancy of a child born with HIV is only two years. With AZT treatment for the pregnant mother, rates of HIV infection drop from 25% to 8%. Uh, if you remember, uh, Magic Johnson uh, had HIV. And uh, the question was, oh, and his wife got pregnant after that. And so the question was, how in the world uh, does, does she have uh, HIV, and will the baby be infected with HIV? And the reality was that he was, ta he was on AZT treatment. She never contracted the, uh, the disease. She never, uh, and he, he never uh, had uh, full-blown AIDS. He just had an HIV infection. And the baby is, uh, is probably 10 or, or 11 years old by this time, and uh, he is uh, HIV-free. Pregnant addicts often live chaotic lifestyles that don't afford time or the wherewithal to seek or accept prenatal care or medical intervention. When the addict is an adolescent, the individual is at greater risk and even less likely to seek treatment. Other problems are likely because of her physical, emotional, and behavioral immaturity. She, her, she's thinking with her amygdala, not with her prefrontal cortex. Sorry, I was getting a drink. <clears throat> Besides the effect of the drug on the fetus, the mother's toxic environment often has deleterious effects on the fetus and the mother. Uh, because she's using drugs, she doesn't care about eating. Or if she's on if she's on crystal meth, she doesn't need to eat because she gets all of her energy from her from her drugs. Bloodborne infections, as we said before, hepatitis C. Uh, there's also syphilis out there, uh, and it's making a comeback, as exciting as all that is. Domestic violence, uh, STDs, sexually transmitted diseases, as we were just talking about. Most psychoactive substances readily cross a placental barrier, meaning that the tiny infant is exposed to the same drugs at the same level as the mother. After birth, the drugs will be passed to the baby in the mother's breast milk. And this is true of marijuana as, as well. And that's something that we also need to think about. Marijuana, the THC is passed to the baby uh, when the baby is breastfeeding. When the mother tokes, the baby tokes. <clears throat> because of the excessive organ and brain development, the 12 weeks, the first trimester, uh, is the most critical period in the, uh, in the baby's life. Drugs used during this time period can change the baby both physically and mentally. However, since the brain continues to grow throughout gestation, neurological damage can be done at any juncture during gestation. This has to do with any drugs. Uh, as I told you, and as I mentioned before, uh, my great niece uh, was a heroin user, and she used heroin throughout her pregnancy. And now I have a great, great nephew uh, who was addicted to heroin for the first six weeks of his life. But what damage has been done? We don't know. He's only three or four at this point. If heroin or cocaine is used during the last trimester, they might cause premature birth. If the baby is born after the mother has used drugs on a regular basis, the ne neonatal period will be fraught with intoxication, withdrawal, and eventually developmental or learning dis delays. If the infant is given concentrated care after birth, they will manage to catch up with their non-drug exposed peers, potentially by toddlerhood. And theoretically, this child is very, uh, very intelligent. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see what happens to this kid because mom and grandma uh, didn't turn out real well. So we'll see what happens with this, with this kid. Alcohol is one of the most devastating effects on the fetus uh, of all the drugs. Uh, the effects of alcohol have been studied more than any other psychoactive substance because of its prevalence and the general acceptability of the drug. And strangely enough, I was working at the hospital uh, where they first made this uh, connection uh, between alcohol and brain tissue. Uh, it was really weird. I was working at, uh, they discovered it in, in the uh, 1980s, and they started doing uh, uh, research uh, with it uh, in, so, in select por portions of the United States. Unfortunately, it was first discovered uh, on the Indian reservations in uh, South Dakota. And I was working in Omaha. And we weren't wor working with the, uh, the natives living in South Dakota. 
but there's a large native population in northern uh, Nebraska, northeastern Nebraska. The uh, Ho Chunk, uh, there's Ho Chunks there. There's Teton Sioux. Uh, I'm trying to think who else is there. Uh, the Oto, the Omaha. Uh, they have reservations up in northeastern, uh, northeast eastern Nebraska. So I was working at St. Joseph Hospital in Omaha, and uh, at the uh, uh, there was a doctor that was working on, he was doing research, and unfortunately the guy was a drunk, uh, as weird as that sounds. Anyway, he used to come into, he used to come into the lab all the time, and, and he would uh, uh, incubate something, or he would uh, uh, put something in, the, uh, in our refrigerators. I don't know why he didn't have incubators. You would have thought he would have had them. Um, anyway, uh, so I was in on the beginning of this stuff, and he used to talk to us all the time. And you could tell he was drunk. <laughs> it was sad. The effects of alcohol have been studied uh, more than any other psychoactive substance because of the prevalence and the general acceptability of that drug. It's legal. Uh, when a mother uh, drinks uh, during pregnancy, the possible effects on the fetus are referred to as fetal alcohol syndrome disorder or spectrum disorder. Uh, the most severe form of uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is fetal alcohol syndrome. Fetal alcohol syndrome is characterized by physical abnormalities, and they're not attractive. Uh, mental abnormalities, uh, their uh, corpus callosum is much smaller. Their brain uh, mass is, is smaller. They have fewer convolutions in their brain. Uh, behavioral uh, abnormalities. These babies are born to mothers who drank heavily during their pregnancy. Uh, we saw pictures of this uh, earlier uh, when we were talking about alcohol. Growth of FAS uh, fetuses occurs in the womb, uh, reduced height, reduced weight, reduced head circumference, reduced brain growth, reduced brain size, facial deformities, uh, their eyelids are shortened, uh, they have a thin upper lip, they have a flattened mid face, and the philtrum, the shallow groove in the upper lip is gone, uh, so they have no philtrum. Uh, heart problems, uh, limb problems, delayed intellectual development, neurological abnormalities, behavioral problems, visual problems, hearing loss, balance, and gait problems. Watching a television show last night. I'm sorry. So I was watching a movie last night, uh, and uh, Helen Hunt was on. Helen Hunt has had uh, her face uh, reconstruction surgery. <laughs> She's had a facelift, okay? And one of the interesting things that, that uh, she had done to her, trying to tighten her face up, she, the philtrum, uh, her philtrum is gone. And through the whole thing, I'm looking at her, I'm thinking, oh my God, she looks like a, a kid with uh, fetal alcohol syndrome because she doesn't have a filter. Anyway, I guess only people that take this class or people that know about uh, fetal alcohol syndrome understand what they're looking at. When they're looking at some lady that's had a facelift that, uh, where the filter is gone. Part of fetal, fetal alcohol syndrome or spectrum disorder are less severe disorders. Uh, Alcohol-related neuro, neurodevelopmental disorders, ARND. Alcohol-related uh, birth defects, ARBD. Uh, worldwide uh, fetal alcohol syndrome affects as many as 2.9 per 1,000 births. In the United States, the rate is 2 per 1,000. Uh, and as an example, uh, the number of people with the coronavirus in New York, New York State is uh, 4.3 per 1,000. Uh, so here we, you can see the, the difference. Among African Americans, the rate is 6 per 1,000. Uh, Asian, uh, Hispanics, and whites have rates between 1 to 2 per 1,000. American Indians, this is really sad. American Indians have rates between 10 and 30 per 1,000. And these are mostly, uh, this is especially prevalent in, uh, in South Dakota, in the Northern Plains, actually, in South Dakota, North Dakota, and Montana. As tragic as uh, that is for that area. In one study of, of fetal alcohol syndrome adolescents and adults, it was discovered that all of them had been physically and sexually abused, 60% of the abuse occurring before adulthood. The individuals averaged six diagnosable mental illnesses. Select ones had 10 or more mental illnesses, as if you can imagine. Cocaine and amphetamines were used by 558,000 women in the United States every year 
with most of them falling in the reproductively viable range. In the 1980s, when cocaine was uh, use was at its peak, it was estimated that 4.5% of all babies born in the United States were exposed to cocaine in the womb. Unfortunately, I was working in Omaha at the time. Uh, I was working in uh, Children's Hospital. And we were getting all of the uh, cocaine um, babies, and most of them didn't survive. A lot of them didn't survive. At the time, we had never seen anything like this before. All of a sudden, we're getting these babies with uh, really strange abnormalities. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of these abnormalities were so severe that the, the child would, was not able to survive. In inner city hospitals where cocaine use was more prevalent, the percentages ranged from 15 to 25 percent. Who were the people using cocaine? It was mostly the wealthy people of, uh, of uh, uh, Omaha and Nebraska and uh, western uh, Iowa. Uh, and those were the people that we were getting. We were getting the kids from the, the wealthy families. Uh, it was just a tragedy. Effects of stimulants, increased heart rate, constricted blood vessels affects not only the mother, but the in unborn fetus. For the fetus, the constricted blood vessels result in restricted blood flow, of course, restricted nutrients, restricted oxygen. So anytime you're restricting blood flow, you're not getting fed. Uh, the, uh, the cells that are trying to grow are not getting oxygen. They're not getting nutrients. And of course, it retards the growth. Uh, for habitual users, the effects can be more pronounced. In extreme cases, the increased blood pressure may cause the placenta to separate from the uterine wall, resulting in spontaneous abortion. My great niece, the dumb shit that she is, uh, was not only using uh, heroin, uh, but she was also using a, a substitute opioid that was supposed to replace the heroin so that she could uh, give birth to the child. This uh, supplement was supposed to not affect the child as much as heroin did. She was using both of them at the same time. She used to take pictures of herself sitting there with uh, showing off her big belly with a cigarette in her mouth. Uh, as stupid as that is, I guess that's the cool thing to do. Uh, but unfortunately, of course, now we have a, I have a great, great nephew who is the uh, result of her, her stupidity. Excessive use of stimulants can raise the fetus's blood pressure, causing a stroke. Using, the, uh, using in the third trimester can result in extreme activity in the fetus, causing uterine contractions and premature labor. And this baby was born prematurely. Withdrawal from the fetus involves several weeks of extreme agitation, increased respiration, hyperactivity, uh, possible seizure. Uh, she's so cool that uh, she was uh, impregnated by her supplier and she started living with her supplier. Uh, and uh, that's one of the reasons that, it's one of the really intelligent things that she's done in her life. Effects last uh, uh, in, into the child's second year with lifelong disability rates of 33%. We're not, I, I'm not looking forward to, to finding out what happens to this kid. But I'm sure I will, <clears throat> and I'll tell you at the, when I find out. Since opioid uh, use uh, tends to be more continuous than binge use of stimulants, the effects are greater. Uh, problems include severe infections from IV drug use for the mother, uh, fetal growth retardation, miscarriage, stillbirth, separation of the placenta from the uterus. I guess we're lucky in that uh, she was living with her supplier. Uh, so she was, she had clean needles uh, and she didn't contract uh, either hepatitis C, syphilis, or HIV. Babies born to heroin addicts are often premature, smaller, and weaker. And this one certainly was all three of those. Uh, as I, he was in intensive care for, I worked at uh, the NICU in, uh, in Omaha. <clears throat> and uh, and uh, I saw babies in there for an extended length of time. He was in there for six weeks. And uh, I, I don't know who paid, I, I do know who paid for it. The state paid for it because she didn't have any money. She was on welfare. These infants have abnormal sleep patterns. It leads to a 600% increase in, in uh, sudden infant death syndrome deaths. Uh, 60 to 80% of babies born to opioid addicted mothers go through withdrawals two to three days after they are born. Uh, they have hyperactivity, incessant high pitched crying that sounds like a cat screaming. It is the most ungodly thing 
that you can possibly imagine. Uh, it puts everybody's nerves on edge. Uh, when I when we had uh, one of those kids in NICU, they had to rotate the nurses out every 15 minutes because it was causing so much stress from just the sound of the baby crying. And of course, they had to put him in uh, special uh, soundproof areas so they didn't bother the other uh, NICU babies. Babies. Irregular sleep patterns, uh, increased muscle tone, uh, increased respiration, poor suckling, failure to thrive, irritability, sweating, tremors, diarrhea, sneezing, sneezing, vomiting, and so very often death because they are addicted to drugs and we cannot treat them for it. Uh, all we can do is, is try to dry them out. And like I said, it took six weeks to dry out my, my great, great nephew. Marijuana is used by 5 to 70% of pregnant women during their pregnancy. A longitudinal study of marijuana exposed uh, fetuses in Canada showed that poor short-term memory and verbal reasoning at age 3, continued poor memory through, throughout childhood, lowered verbal performance throughout childhood, impulsive hyperactivity behavior. In other words, they look like they have ADHD. However, if you treat them with uh, Ritalin or Adderall, uh, it does not work on these kids. Conduct problems, distractibility, poor executive function. The problem with marijuana is the same as the problem with any other drug smoked. It decreases your oxygen. It irritates the alveoli and the bronchii in the lungs. It uh, decreases weight. It, uh, and they go through withdrawals. Abnormal responses to visual stimuli are, are impaired. Increased tremulousness. Easily, they're easily startled, it is, they, and they'll start crying, and they give off this high-pitched cat scream uh, that uh, is, uh, well, there it is right there, high-pitched crying. Um, what are the effects, the, the fetal effects on drugs? Uh, category A drugs, uh, no, there are no fetal risks. These are the vitamins uh, other than vitamin A. Uh, there are no, no fetal risks, so you can take all the vitamins well, they, of course, give the mother a broad-spectrum vitamin, uh, but not vitamin A. They, they need to stay away from vitamin A. Category B is, are, is uh, acetaminophen and ibuprofen, uh, your pain controls. Uh, acetaminophen, of course, is Tylenol. Uh, ibuprofen is, uh, I don't know, I never, uh, Motrin is, is, is ibuprofen. And there are no fetal risks as far as, as acetaminophen and ibuprofen are concerned. Category C drugs or most other medications, there tends to be no fetal risks as far as category C drugs are concerned. Category D drugs are the anti-seizure and benzodiazepines, uh, as well as tetracycline. Tetracycline is a really strong antibiotic. Um, uh, people used to take it in Vietnam as a prophylactic against gonorrhea, and it actually worked if you could get a hold of this stuff, uh, tetra tetracycline. Anyway. Uh, we used to <laughs> we had a problem keeping tetracycline in the hospital. Fetal risk, uh, there is a fetal risk, but the risks are considered appropriate to the need of the mother. If she is epileptic, then she can take her, her anti-seizure medication. Uh, she'd take benzodiazepines if she had a really serious panic attack problem or uh, anxiety uh, problems. And of course, tetracycline is used for different kind, types of infections. People take it for, um, they take it for acne. Uh, so she potentially, well, they probably take her off tetracycline and just let her have her, her pimples. Category X, uh, uh, the teratogenics are Accutane. Accutane is a really strong tetracycline. And of course, Accutane was something else that they used as a prophylactic in Vietnam. Uh, and vitamin A, got to stay away from vitamin A. Fetal risks are too great for the benefits, so the mother needs to stay away from vitamin A. Any medication prescribed for a pregnant woman should be closely monitored. Uh, the use of non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory drugs can, can elevate the mother's, uh, the pregnant mother's uh, blood pressure. That's uh, acetaminophen and ibuprofen and aspirin. Uh, benzodiazepines can accumulate in the fetus's blood, even at safe levels for the mother. Because of the fetus's smaller system, it will take longer for the infant to clear the drugs from their system, and maybe they may be born addicted. Because of the slowness in clearing the infant's system, the baby will be born with withdrawals 
that may persist for weeks. At the turn of the 20th century, women rarely smoked. In the 1920s, only 5% of pregnant women smoked. Pregnant women's uh, smoking peaked in 1997 at 28.2%. In the 1950s, they were told if they had uh, morning sickness that uh, tobacco was a good way to uh, keep them from vomiting. In uh, 2005, only 22.5% of pregnant women smoked during the pregnancy. 17% uh, of women smoked cigarettes. 8.82% smoked right up to the time that they gave birth, as stupid as that sounds. The highest rates were among African Americans at 20.12%. The second highest rate was those dumb white people at 14.2%. Cigarettes are especially dangerous because of the nicotine and carbon monoxide found in the smoke along with 2,000 other compounds. Both carbon monoxide and nicotine cross a placental barrier and reduce fetal oxygen supplies. Women who smoke or come in contact with secondhand smoke are in greater risk of premature delivery. Heavy smoking mothers are twice as likely to miscarry or have spontaneous abortions. Babies born to heavy smokers average a birth weight of seven ounces uh, less with a smaller head circumference and about an inch shorter. Uh, with heavy smokers, there is a higher incidence of cleft palate, congenital heart defects, minor nerve and brain defects, higher incidence of uh, sudden infant death syndrome, weaker sucking reflex, reflex, depressed immune system, more respiratory infections. The problem with a weaker sucking reflex, reflex is that the individual doesn't get enough nutrition. The, the, the uh, newborn doesn't get enough uh, uh, nutrition. And because of that, they may develop uh, failure to thrive syndrome because they're not gaining weight at the right level. Uh, so being, having a weaker uh, sucking reflex is very, very important. Caffeine is a common drug taken in the pregnant women in tea, coffee, and soda pop. In one study, 75% of the babies born had caffeine in their system at birth. Uh, infants tend to have lower tolerance for caffeine than adults do. Uh, caffeine seems to have no long-lasting effects on the child, though physicians warn pregnant women away from it's used during pregnancy. I can remember when my daughter was pregnant. My daughter got pregnant at 42. She gave birth at 43, which is, is old. Uh, and of course, the both I, I, I've been wanting grand babies forever. Uh, well, not forever. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Ever since I, my kids were born, I wanted grandkids. Uh, but uh, neither of my kids uh, decided to, to help me out, except my daughter. Finally, had had uh, her baby at uh, at forty. She got pregnant at forty two. But during her pregnancy, of course, she's a she's a biology teacher. So she decided she'd go off caffeine, which was not the easiest thing in the world for her because she is she drinks a lot of uh, diet Pepsi. Uh, that was her drink, and she had to go off diet Pepsi. And she had to make sure there was no caffeine in this or caffeine in that. Uh, she uh, stopped eating chocolate. Uh, she didn't drink any tea. She makes lots and lots and lots and lots of tea, but of course she had to go off tea as well. Uh, so it was nine months of torture for her, the poor thing. Uh, prevention, but the baby was born. He's perfect. He's probably the smartest kid in the world, and he's very athletic. So I guess she's, she's happy. I'm happy. And uh, the kid seems to be happy, too. Prevention of damage uh, should start as soon as the woman discovers that she is pregnant. Uh, physicians will ask the woman the four Ps. Your parents, did either of the woman's parents have a problem with drugs or alcohol? Uh, partner, uh, did, does the woman's partner have a problem with alcohol or drugs? Using it in the, in the, the uh, mother's presence uh, can lead to secondhand smoke, second, thirdhand smoke or third hand, whatever. Uh, past, has the woman ever uh, drunk beer or wine or liquor? And of course, my daughter did. Uh, she was a, uh, she drank on a relatively regular basis uh, before she got pregnant. Uh, pregnancy, in the month, as a matter of fact, she met her, her uh, baby daddy in a bar, as weird as that is. They decided to have a kid without getting married. And of course, that's so cute, isn't it? Pregnancy in the month before the woman knew that she was pregnant, did she smoke cigarettes, take drugs, or drink beer, wine, or liquor? If necessary, the woman can be treated for dependence, for her dependence, 
the most frequently abused drugs, so that we're, now we're talking about youth in school. The most frequently abused drugs, 46.5% uh, among high school seniors, uh, tobacco 21.6%, marijuana 18.3%, smokeless tobacco 6.1%, and that's not true up in Montana uh, because smokeless tobacco is, is very widely used up there. Uh, Painkillers 3.8%, amphetamines 3.7%, tranquilizers 2.7%, cocaine 2.5%, inhalants 1.5%, hallucinogens 1.5%, MDMA 1.3%, steroids 1.1%, heroin 0.4%, and any illicit drugs 22.1%. At least in the last uh, 20 years, uh, tobacco and alcohol use has actually declined while marijuana use has primarily stayed the same. Now that it has been legalized in 11 states, uh, I'm not sure that that's true anymore. School environment has the greatest influence on drug and alcohol use. Uh, if the individual can reach the age of 21 without smoking and drinking, they probably never will start smoking and drinking. Uh, the people who experiment with alcohol and tobacco, uh, more susceptible, are they more susceptible to peer pressure? 85.7% are still smoking in the 12th grade. If they had been drunk sometime in high school, 83.3% are still getting drunk. Uh, if they had ever tried marijuana, 76.4% are still toking. Adolescents who use marijuana weekly are six times likelier to cut class or to skip school. This is really good news for those states that have legalized marijuana. One of the great oxymorons of adolescents is that while they think that they uh, that their own thoughts they think of their own thoughts as beyond question and their lives as invulnerable, uh, they commit uh, some of the most ill-advised acts that can sometimes lead to death: intoxication, intoxication in driving, intoxication in having sex. Who was that guy? Seventy percent of teen suicides involve uh, alcohol. 50% of date rapes involve alcohol. 40% of drownings involve alcohol. We're going to stop right here. Uh, we're going to, we're, and I'm going to, to create a second uh, lecture for the 8th of uh, April uh, because I need to get through, I would like to get through the, uh, uh, all, all of the material uh, before, we, uh, before we're done. Uh, so I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, have a, a second lecture this week. Uh, and we're going to stop right here right now. So let me see if I can do this. Okay, there we go. Okay, I'll see you guys. Uh